This week's episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene is brought to you by Aaron Vlex, The Private Collector, an all-new audio drama that's equal parts noir and H.P. Lovecraft, and that's coming March 31st from the Wicked Library. Frank Enfield, gumshoe in the Big Apple, loses his partner from the Cartwright and Enfield Detective Agency to some nasty star-headed creature out of somebody's worst nightmare. In true frying pan into the fire tradition, Frank joins forces with an enigmatic figure known only as the librarian, who sends him on a series of cases. His mission? Retrieve a seemingly endless collection of sinister volumes the librarian once taken out of circulation and kept under lock and key in his private collection. The Private Collector, a special monthly series available only on Parsec Award winner The Wicked Library. Episode 1 is out right now. Look for it at thewickedlibrary.com and on iTunes and YouTube. This week's episode is also brought to you by Creature Feature Weekend, a brand new horror convention taking place Labor Day weekend in historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Meet actors such as Corey Feldman, celebrities such as Joe Bob Briggs, and authors such as your very own Brian Keene. For details, go to CreatureFeatureWeekend.com. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, YouTube, and all other platforms. Joining me this week, as always, to my left, Mr. Excitement himself, Dave Thomas. Good morning. I think it's still morning. <laughs> and, and to my right... The man we call Dandelion, <laughs> hey, author everybody. and podcaster Matt Wildeson. What's going on? You guys are uh, full of not energy this week. Uh, I think it's just been a shitty week for everybody. Yeah. I think it's been a shitty week. And I yeah. think it might also be that uh, the other part of our yeah. team, Professor Mary San Giovanni, is not here with us this week. Yeah, yeah her uh, bubbly personality is yeah. missing. Yeah, she, uh, There's going to be a lot of dumb this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's... Uh, <laughs> She's getting a medical procedure done today. Nothing to worry about. Just oh, okay. a, a very minor thing. But, I was like, yeah. what the fuck did you tell me? No. Um, <laughs> she, she wanted to, because, of course, you know, uh, this week's show we are going to talk about uh, William, William H. Pugmire. We're doing a tribute to him. And, right. uh, you know, that's in her wheelhouse, mm-hmm. Cosmic Horror, Lovecrafting Horror. Right. Uh, she is, however, going to do an episode about him on an upcoming uh, broadcast of Cosmic Shenanigans. Good. If, you, you know, if you're a new listener, hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mary Mary San Giovanni actually has a, a sister podcast to the show yes. called Cosmic Shenanigans. Um, it's very academic and very learned. Yeah, if you and, want to be able to just drive and just learn everything you need to know about literature and cosmic horror, yeah, it's the perfect you know, podcast. Yeah. Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft, you know, she she goes deep. She also does modern cosmic horror. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not that show. <laughs> <laughs> not, you'll, you'll become painfully aware of that very quickly. <laughs> hey, you know, speaking of uh, Clark Ashton Smith, we have a lot to get to today, so I, I'm not going to do like a, a ten minute review, but um, I finally got to watch the Clark Ashton Smith documentary, Emperor of Dreams, because okay. okay. uh, it's it's streaming on Amazon Prime right now. Oh, cool! Um, you know, it's a it's a feature length documentary that explores you know Clark Ashton Smith's work and life as a solitary artist living in Auburn, California. Uh, you know, much of it is it, it's not just about 
Smith. It's also about his town and how the two influenced and interacted with each other. Um, I thought it was fascinating. You know, for a for a Smith junkie like me, mm-hmm. there was a lot of stuff there I did not know. Um, you know, Matt, for someone like you, I suspect you've never read Clark Ashton Smith. No, I haven't. Um, for someone like you, I, I think you could hop right in and learn a lot. Um, Dungeon Master, if you're a new listener, Dungeon Master is uh, my 11-year-old son. We don't use his real name on the air. Um, he was here while I was watching it, and now he's fascinated with Zothique, mm-hmm. you know, which oh, cool. was... Uh, Clark Ashton Smith's, uh, you know, fictional mythological world. What do you think, Dave? Is is Eleven too young to start reading Tales of Zothique? Hmm. I would normally say no. However, just because he's eleven doesn't mean like he's way smarter than your average eleven year old. Right. I I would give him a story and see what he thinks. I mean, like he's read he's read Narnia cover to cover. He's read The Hobbit. He. Started Lord of the Rings, and he did the same thing I did at age eleven. He got to Tom Bombadil and threw the book down. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. You know. I did the same thing too. So, yeah, stupid Tom Bombadil. I, like I said, I, I think I think because he's read The Hobbit, um, certainly, I think he could deal with it. Yeah. Like I said, give him a short story, see what he thinks. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, like like every eleven year old, he's he loves all things Cthulhu. Sure. And, and when you think about that, <laughs> I can't really you, think you think about no, Lovecraft <laughs> yeah. and the mythos, yeah. and, you know, first of all, what would have happened to the mythos had August Derelith not, you know, championed Lovecraft's work? Well, I've always death, said it would have faded into him. Yeah, yeah. But when you, you think about all that, and you think about now where, okay, I, I spoke to his fifth grade class last year. They had me in to talk about writing and reading and, and the two biggest questions I got, number one, it was, what's it like to write comic books? Because, you know, they wanted to hear all yeah, about, hear about comics, yeah, superheroes. Sure. Sure. But the number two question, you know, what's it like to write about Cthulhu? Like, these, these children never read a horror novel or a story in their life, but they all know Cthulhu. He's so prevalent he in pop up culture in now. so many cartoons. Yeah. I mean, I'm and, assuming your two answers were, for one, it's the most aggra- <laughs> aggravating business I've ever been in, and two, it's really fun to write Cthulhu. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> if only Cthulhu could eat the people involved in the comic book industry. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. We should fund that. I, yeah. w- I would love to see Cthulhu Zofique. kills the Marvel Universe. Cullen Bunn would write it. Yeah. Um, I know. I would love to see Zothique get that sort of pop culture reference. Sure, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So maybe it's just a matter of getting this generation to read those stories. I mean, the, the, the documentary is certainly a, a, a good way to maybe get the word out about him. I see a lot yeah. of people don't know necessarily yeah. know about his work. Like, I mean, you're too young to have known who Clark Ashton Smith was. Yeah, so, but uh, you definitely should check his stuff out. I had no idea this was on Amazon Prime, so it's totally going to be on the next time. Okay, I so watch. this is—I was just about yep. to ask you em- where it was. Emperor of Dreams. Emperor um, it's on Amazon Prime. It's still playing like the film festival circuit. Like I believe it's playing uh, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest later this month. I can't okay. remember where exactly. Spokane, maybe. Maybe, okay. yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a. I know there's a film festival coming up out there. As I've seen some of the people talking about, it, but I don't remember exactly what city it's in. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's that's cool. Speaking of Amazon Prime, really quickly, I finally got a chance to watch that uh, Braun Cell Block Ninety Nine. Oh, that's a great flick. Uh, great flick. You you liked it more than I did. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, it's a good movie. It's not a great movie. First of all, Vince Vaughn is amazing in it. Absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. The fight choreography is really, really good. It's just glacially paced. Like, it takes forever to get going. Yeah. So, See, I feel like... Like but we've gone, we've movie. gone from the Emperor of Dreams documentary yeah. to, to Brawl and Cell Block Ninety Nine. <laughs> it's like going from <laughs> Thomas Thomas Ligotti to you know William W. Johnston. Uh, you know. <laughs> They're I'm, very different. <laughs> I, I'm not a I'm not very smart, as we all know. But because uh, I remember you mentioning it, and the other night I was looking for someone to watch. I'm like, oh, Brian recommended this, and like I said, I liked it. I didn't love it, but. Again, in I know you're a huge Vince Vaughn fan. He's amazing in this movie. Oh, it yeah. might be the best thing I've ever seen him in. Yeah. Seriously. No, he's, he's fantastic. He's absolutely amazing. And uh, like I said, I liked it, especially the second half. I, I want to know one. your thoughts on the new Devin Townsend album. Oh, well, I, I can certainly give you those if you, if you want uh-huh. to hear that. Listeners, if, yeah. if you, I, I would like to know this. There's got to be at least two listeners out, <laughs> yeah. of, our, out of our 40... <laughs> 
out, out of the 40,000 of you yeah. that tune in every week, there has to be at least two of you. Well, well there's, there's one for sure. There's, Dave. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely one. Uh, ben Martin on Twitter has asked, asked specifically for this segment of the show, so you can blame him okay. if you're not into this. Now, I'll keep this relatively short because this is not a music show. Uh, but yeah, the new Devin Townsend album, Empath, came out last week. So now I've only had it for a few days, so I haven't had a chance to listen to it like a million times yet and really get into it. It takes me a long time when new music comes out to really form an opinion about it because I need to listen to it a lot. But I can tell you this right now, even after just a few listens, this is among the best things he's ever recorded out of 20-something albums at this point in his career. Wow. Yeah, no. Nice. Um, he used to work with what he called the Devin Townsend Project. And basically, if it's Devin Townsend Project, it's more straightforward. And when he does stuff under his own, his own name, it's kind of more experimental. Okay. He let the project go because it was costing him fifteen grand a month in salaries and stuff Jeez. to keep these guys together. And he spent, according to an interview, $170,000 of his own money on this record. Damn. Now I gotta say it shows the production value. Now his production values in general, his records all sound great. This is phenomenal. I mean, the, it's it's very. It takes all of his influences. You know, he's obviously he's a metal guy, but he does prog stuff. You know, he he does opera things. He does you know classical music. You know, it it takes all of those influences and puts them together. Uh, it's different songs, but honest to God, it it kind of flows together like one big piece of music, like uh, an hour plus. The last track is twenty three minutes long. It is. Maybe top five songs ever he's ever recorded. You think twenty three minutes? It's no, it's it's fascinating and it it flows the way everything flows together on the record is just, is really cool. Uh, there's a couple of videos out he's put out. Um, there's one for a song called Genesis. If you're not familiar with all with Devin, I think that you watch this and you're going to be very confused. But it kind of gives you an idea of what this album sounds like because there's a lot of different influences in the same song. Uh, got some guest musicians as always. Uh, Steve Vai's on the record. Oh, nice. Yeah. Anneke, Anneke von Giesenberger from the, the Gathering of the Bands. She shows up on a lot of Devon Records. You've heard her voice. Um, Chad Kroger from uh, oh, Nickelback. Get, get yeah, out. He shows up. So he's still Canadian, doing something. Yeah, fellow Canadian <laughs> shows up on there. Um, and uh, Mike Keneally, who's a, if you're into prog rock, you'll know who Mike Keneally is. He's another guitar player. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of other people. Uh, I can't say enough good things about this. I, I was Last year, he released like a 30-second clip of him working with an orchestra in Eastern Europe because there's an actual orchestra on the record. And I remember at the time commenting to Bracken McLeod, who is also a huge Devon fan, I'm like, this 30 seconds is better than any other album that's been put out this year. So <laughs> I realize it's very early in 2019. I will be stunned if there's a better record in 2019. That's a bold endorsement. No, I'm yeah. telling you, this th it, I was blown away, and I had expected this to be great, because any time he really pours himself into something like this, uh, it, you come away with musical greatness. I mean, you know, you go way back to the beginning, he was doing the strapping young lad stuff, and it's kind of like what was going on in his head at the time with bipolar disorder. That's what it musically sounds like. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just raw emotion. And this, again, he's obviously much older at this point, but it's a different form of emotion, but it's still, it's very honest and real. And um, I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, I am blown away. I do recommend buying the deluxe version, which has a bunch of demo songs in the second CD, because his demo songs usually things he leaves off his albums are like better than what most people put there on their albums. That's so cool. yeah. yeah, so I always I always recommend getting the demo version uh, for for Brian and people like Brian. There is a vinyl version out. Uh, he always puts his stuff out on vinyl. Uh, in fact, uh, he's been putting out box sets of all his past works on vinyl. Which again, I I don't have vinyl because like I need more things to spend money on. <laughs> but everybody that I know has bought these and said, oh my God, this is some of the best vinyl pressings I've ever heard. Huh. So if you're into oh, cool. Devin, I highly recommend getting the box set. I recommend getting this. Uh, like I said, there's three videos from the album already on YouTube. Genesis was the first one. I forget which songs are on YouTube, but one of them features a uh, animation, an animation about a cat in space. So that's Phoebe's favorite song. Um, <laughs> you know, she's really into that. <laughs> so, uh, But again, it's, awesome. it's like if you like... If you're just not into like one style of music, I think this will really appeal to you if you've never heard Devin before. So, and if you've never heard this show before, yeah. hey, they're doing a tribute to William H. Pugmire. I'll t <laughs> this guy babbling about music songs about a cat in space. <laughs> Well, he has some work. I tease. Well, I tease. No, I We're getting there. He's got, a, he's got a whole album about an alien called Ziltoid who's in the search for the perfect cup of coffee. So, you know, a lot of people compare Devin huh. like, to... He's not like Frank Zappa, but he kind of reminds you of Frank Zappa. Right. He does like crazy stuff like this. Like a, like a, know, a heavy metal Frank Zappa. Yeah, you never know what he's going to do next. And that's one of why my two favorite musicians all time are Devin Townsend and uh, Steve Wilson from Porcupine Tree. Because the first time you hear any of the music, you hear like 10 seconds of it, you know it's them, first of all. Right. They're very yeah. unique style. But I also like 
that especially with Devin, you never know what he's going to do. You, ne- you have no idea. And he's also one of the funniest people you'll ever see on stage. Like, between songs, like he can be a stand-up comedian. He's hilarious. So, uh, he's touring Europe right now. Hopefully the tour is coming to America, so I, I get a chance to see this there stuff before so, live. So, that's sweet. my review for the so, week. So, Clark Thank Esther you. Smith's Epper yeah. of Dreams, yeah. uh, the new Devin Towns. Matt, what do you, you got something you want to... Well, when you when you sent a text message out where you're like, Dave, Dave, you do this. I'm gonna I'll talk about this movie. Matt, you just you pick a movie or something. Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't like, want you to sit there in silence. Now, see the only I the only movie I've watched recently, which is why I'm not going to go with a movie for this one, was that Ben uh, Ben the Curve or whatever that documentary. It was about the flat earthers theories and stuff. Oh yes, oh, yeah. I watched. That. But everybody's seen that, so there's really I no point that. in talking about it. It's <laughs> fucking hilarious. Yeah. That's all. That's my I have five seen second yet, review. I need to watch that for somebody yeah. who loves science and shit like yes. you. Watch it. It's, it's hilarious, but it's heartbreaking. It's sad. Well, yeah, because yeah, they disprove their own goddamn theories you multiple know, times and within you the see documentary. The, the emotional toll and trauma it takes on these people yeah. when they they realize, oh, I'm just a dumb fuck. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> But um, so we don't normally talk games, so I figured I would do a quick game review. Yes, because currently I am extremely aggravated with Sekiro: Shadows Die Twice. <laughs> uh, I'm a big Dark Souls fan, so From Software is the company that made Dark Souls and Bloodborne and Demon Souls. I played all of them, beat all of them, love them. This game is the hardest fucking thing I've ever played in my life, because when you go through all the prior games, the idea of it is blocking and dodging. Right. Get out of the way, you know, attack from the back, pick away at your enemies, you know. This one changed it all up. You're supposed to deflect attacks with because you have no shield. <laughs> so it's all aggressive attacking. It's dodging. I mean, it's uh it's blocking and parrying and staying like as close to your enemy as you possibly can. Although you're slow as fuck and everybody else you fight is lightning fast. Right. So it it's fucking impossible. I'm still going at it. I haven't even gotten to the first boss So yet. basically, you're Kevin Strange and all your enemies <laughs> are the internet. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. That's a good I, analogy. Yes. I, I watched some people streaming this, and I, first of all, I tried to play Dark Souls and I'm like, no, mm-hmm. I'm going to like break my computer if I keep playing this game. Yeah. Uh, so I watched people streaming this, and everybody has the same opinion. It's like, this game is way too hard. It's a, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. It's it's yeah. Like I used to think Ghosts and Goblins was the hardest game I ever played in my life. This crowned it. Like it's fucking brutal. Ghosts and Goblins is that like a console game or? It was an arcade game. It was an arcade it game. Uh, I don't I, it one. got me banned from my local <laughs> pizza shop for a week. <laughs> Were you like screaming at? Oh, it? I was like, I was. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't old enough to drive, so I must have been 14 or 15, and, and you know, it's summertime, and yeah. every day you ride your bike down to the newsstand, buy a comic book, or, you know, a horror paperback, and then you go hang out at the pizza shop, and I was trying to impress this girl, um, and usually I would impress her with my skills on Mappy. Do you remember the video oh, game Mappy? Oh, Mappy Land? Mappy, yeah, yeah Mappy yeah. Land, yeah. Um, but the older high school kids... You know, like the seniors had Mappy that day, and I didn't want to get my ass kicked. So I'm, I'm gonna impress her on Ghosts and Goblins. <laughs> you didn't impress me. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't impress anyone, uh, and it, it stole all my money. And I, I got so mad that that I kicked the machine. <laughs> and then the old Italian guy who ran, Brian, you good boy, but you out for one week. <laughs> so for one week, I wasn't allowed to hang at the pizza shop. Speaking uh, of games, real quick. I was very excited this past week. Borderlands three was finally announced. Yes, yes. I feel like Borderlands, like Brian, feels like Fallout. So yeah, well, yeah, cool. This is this is my favorite game series of all time. Borderlands is a solid game. Solid series. game. And, if, and they also announced, for example, if you own Borderlands, the first game on Steam, well, they're doing a oh like yeah, a, yeah 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 an upgrade to it. You get a free upgrade. Yep. Um. So and that's today. And the other thing today is a uh, 4K texture pack for Borderlands two and Borderlands oh, three. Oh, cool. Free download. So. uh you can get those. It's good to um, see companies finally giving back. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's. I just, I'm very excited. I'm okay. Very, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got to yeah. see. I, I no, we we went off track, but now I'm going to yeah. contribute to it. Okay. okay. I got to tell you. So I've been playing Fallout 76 every night, yeah. which is an open world game. Sure. You play with other players. Um, my my Xbox gamer tag is is Ob Rules 13. Okay. 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 Which, if you're not a reader or a horror fiction fan, that's going to mean nothing to you. Nothing, yeah. Um, now, occasionally, I'll run into other authors while I'm playing. You know, Matt Hayward, 
mm-hmm. uh, Michael Allen Rose, Mahidabel Wilson, etc. Um, the other night, I ran into a fan of mine. Oh, gosh. Um, That's cool. He, he was like a level 15, and uh, you know I'm level 66 now. And I see this little level 15 struggling in this fight with these super mutants, and I come rolling in, <laughs> and I'm mic'd up, and I make my voice all deep, and I'm like, hello, f- hello, fellow wasteland traveler. I'm here to help. <laughs> and he gives me a thumbs up. <laughs> Uh, you know, the little thumbs up emoticon, and I I lay waste these super mutants, and then I drop him a whole bunch of aid, and then I see the little microphone icon come on, and I hear the guy come on, he's like, are you, I see your gamer tagger, you, are you a fan of Brian King's The Rising? <laughs> and I go, guess what? <laughs> I go, are you going to ask about the ending? And there's like a, a pregnant pause, he's like, Holy shit, you're Brian Keane. <laughs> Brian Keane helped me fight Super Mutants. That is bad. That's awesome. So, hello to him. Uh, I didn't get his name beyond the yeah. game, his gamer tag. Yeah, I don't want to give it out on the air. Yeah, that's, really, that's really cool. Yeah. I, that, that's the kind of stuff why. That's one of the reasons why I like gaming. You never know who you're going to meet while you're playing a game. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know if you saw um, Bethesda, because they did a press conference at uh, PAX last week. PAX right. East was there. Did a whole big thing about all the stuff around. Yeah, I saw, oh yeah, I saw that. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. like the roadmap. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, you never know who's playing. In fact, yeah, if you never know. Yeah. If you've been killed by a very cantankerous seventy year old on in Fallout seventy six, chances are you were killed by legendary comic creator Keith Giffen. <laughs> nice, because that's what he does every evening to blow off stream. He uh, goes on true. Fallout and kills. He just kills. Wasn't he the one who invented a serial killer mode? Is that what he called? Fallout three? He <laughs> played in what he called serial killer mode, where he didn't do the missions. He ran through the world in the order of the missions, but all he did was kill everything he interacted with, every nice. NPC, and he still managed to beat the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. You don't necessarily need the NPCs yeah. in that game at all. So. All right, let's get to the news, yeah. um, and okay. then we'll get to uh, Willem Pugmire's tribute. Um, good news this week. No bad news to report. Hmm. Um, starting off, friend of the show... Uh, still our most popular listened to downloaded episode ever, Maurice Broadus. Yes. However, he's not our most popular episode on YouTube. What's the most popular on YouTube? Christian Jensen's second appearance on this show. Oh, wow. Is our most popular episode <laughs> on odd. YouTube. I would never have guessed Yeah, that. not his first, but it's, I think yeah. it probably has something to do with, uh, he talked about, you know, being banned from Amazon's platform, oh, etc. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, Maurice Broadus. Yes. Um, I read this. This is amazing news. Signed a six-figure deal Mm -hmm. with Tor Books uh, for his debut space opera trilogy. Uh, It was pitched as The Expanse meets Black Panther. It explores intergalactic, an intergalactic Afrofuturist empire. Um, Yeah, six-figure deal. You know, we, we... when nice. Sarah Pinborough got her deal a while back, you know, we were we were happy for her, and we are super fucking happy yeah, for Maurice. Great I, I knew this was coming. I was told, you're not allowed to talk about it yeah. until the press release goes out. I knew something um, was up, but I didn't know what. Yeah. And I saw this the other day. I, I'm so happy for Maurice. Maurice, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Oh, you always listen to the show. And, uh, I can't think of anybody more deserving. No, I mean, Maurice has worked his ass off. This is not like an overnight thing. He's been busting his butt right. for many years. And the fact that, that it was pitched as The Expanse, a.k.a. The Greatest Space Show Ever, meets Black Panther, I'm sold. I'm, like, I'm ready yeah. to go. Yeah. You know, he, he told me that the day after it was announced, he, he said, wow, you were right. I suddenly have all these friends I never knew I had before. Yeah, really? I'm like, yeah, that's going to happen. I said, <laughs> I said, if you haven't put up walls between you and the, the public, you need to do it now. He also gave the horror show an exclusive quote. Ooh, nice. Um, <clears throat> Good job. When, when <laughs> we... <laughs> When we asked him how he feels about this six-figure deal, how, how it's going to change his life, he said, and I quote, money won't change me because I still have Chesia Burke and Brian Keene in my life. <laughs> That's true. Nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Our second news story for the week. Um, of course, all year we've been talking about the, the changes at Deadite Press, Eraserhead Press. Um, you know, earlier, I guess several weeks ago, uh, you know, we talked about Jeff Burke starting his own small press, Section mm-hmm. 31 Productions. In fact, we will have Jeff Burke on the show next week. Nice. Uh, his first interview that he's done since leaving Deadite, and he's going to talk about all that. Um, in the meantime, Rose O'Keefe of Eraserhead Press, of which Deadite is an imprint, 
announced the following yesterday in a, an email to her author. She says, quote, I am still in the process of rebalancing the company after the departure of Jeff Burke, who left Deadite Press at the end of January. Jeff is a one-of-a-kind editor and business partner, and I'm forever grateful for his contributions to Deadite Press. I believe in Jeff and his creative vision, and I'm excited for his next steps in writing and publishing. You may or may not have heard he's in the process of starting up his own small press called Section 31. I encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Um, she goes on to say that Deadite won't be the same without Jeff, but he left us in good shape, and the transition hasn't been too disruptive. All of the books that were scheduled to be released in 2019 and 2020 will proceed on schedule. Um, and she announces that she is now reading and selecting new work for the Deadite Press line during their open submission period. And by the way, Eraserhead and Deadite are in fact open for submissions now. Hmm. Um, of course, the, the main question everyone had, we heard it on last week's show, Lucas Mangum and, and Wes Southern were wondering. Uh, she says, quote, I will not be appointing a new head editor at this time, and I will be acquiring future books for the line myself. Um, again, please recommend your favorite authors to me as I am on the lookout for new talent. Now, note to you idiots out there, <laughs> that doesn't mean you recommend yourself to her. Yeah. yeah. Okay? That doesn't look good. She's, she's <laughs> talking to seasoned authors whom she trusts here, and she's talking to readers. Okay? Mm. That... Yeah, that you know, if you're Bill Snodgrass and and you've written, you know, this novel that interpolates Richard Layman through the prism of Edward Lee's Lovecraftian myth stories, you know, you, you don't recommend yourself to oh, Rose at Deadite yeah. Press. Yeah, you know, um, but yeah, it, you know, if you're a, if you're a fan, I understand Deadite mainly focuses on extreme horror. Yeah, they publish my stuff, but. They're mostly in a, 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 well. They they don't publish all my stuff, but they Solid, yeah. they publish my backlist. They mostly focus on extreme horror. Um, so, you know, certainly submit, but read the submission guidelines first. And yeah, if you're a reader uh, who's who's well versed in that, you know, reach out to Rose and make some recommendations of authors you'd like to see the line publishing. Um, you know, I, I I can speak from personal experience. They're great to work with. They pay on time. Um, you know, I don't have to chase down paychecks, and it's really all an author can ask for. Oh, and they get their books, you get your books out there, and they, they promote them. So. Any sort of creative endeavor, if you don't have to chase after the money, it's just the best thing ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's all the news we have. This, like yeah. I said, it's, it's good it's news. Good, yeah, it's all good, good news. It's all good news. news. Yes. All right, um, let's get to our tribute to Willem. However, before we do that, I want to remind folks, this week's show is brought to you by Creature Feature Weekend, an all-new horror convention uh, taking place in historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on Labor Day weekend of this year. Matt, that's driving distance for you. It is. Will you go meet Corey Feldman? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I go to meet Corey Feldman. Will but... you go to meet the sax player from, from Lost Boys? Oh, yeah. How yeah? Is that? Yeah. 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 How Kelly is that? Owen's very excited to meet him. Author Kelly Owen. <laughs> uh, will you go to meet Brian Keene? Uh... <laughs> If you didn't have access to... <laughs> I guess. I heard he's an asshole. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, for details and to participate, go to CreatureFeatureWeekend.com. This week's show is also brought to you by The Private Collector, a special monthly audio series available only on Parsec Award winner The Wicked Library. Episode 1 is out now. Look for it at TheWickedLibrary.com. It's also available on iTunes and YouTube. All right. So last week, you know, we did tributes to Larry Cohen and and our friend Joe Pilato, and uh, people asked why we didn't include a tribute to Willem H. Pugmire. Well, there's two reasons. First of all, he uh, we I got news that he had passed the morning we were recording. We right. were going to record in an, an hour, and I found out, and it it had just started. The news had just started to hit the internet at that point. Um, an hour is not enough time. No, nowhere near to enough. do do Willem H. Pugmire justice. Um, I mean, he deserves a full show. He is always somebody I wanted to have on this show. Uh, but you know, we we were what Dave two hundred and fifteen episodes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've only ever done one interview that wasn't in person. We we insist on doing in person interviews. I feel it 
it, it makes a difference. It yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we were just never in a, in a, in a place to, to interview Willem. Uh, so we never did get to have him on the show, but he, he deserves a, a full show to himself. One other note before we get into this. Um, I've seen some people talking online uh, about which gender pronoun Willem preferred. Um, I've heard Willem refer to himself as he. I mean, you know, he went by the Queen of Eldritch Horror, mm-hmm. but I've heard him refer to himself as he. I've, I've listened to and read countless interviews of people refer to him as he. His friends refer to him as he. Uh, the tributes that we've collected here, some people refer to Willem as he. Some people refer to him as she. No one means to cause offense. No one is trying to misgender Willem. Um, you know, Willem liked to fuck with people. Mm-hmm. You know, like <laughs> like his middle initial, Hop Frog, right, from Edgar Allan Poster. And, you know, he would change the spelling of his name. Like his last name. It'd be one thing on Facebook. It'd be one thing, you know, here elsewhere yeah. on the internet. He liked to play with people. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, we mean no offense as far as uh, his right. preferred mm-hmm. pronoun. I'm going to refer to Willem as he. Um, so, yeah, as I said, he passed away as we were recording last week's show. He was 67 years old. Um, I cannot say that he was a close personal friend. Uh, but I knew him. We were acquaintances. Um, I first met him back in, I guess it was 2000 or 2001, um, in Seattle. Um, but, he, you know, he was always very gracious and very kind to me over the years, um, which not a lot of people have been. Uh, but he always was, you know, and his loss is just it's felt by many in our field. Um you know, we've talked on this show before. I got my start writing for the fanzines in the late 90s. Will and Pugmire was in every one of those fanzines. Um, and, and he was, you know, he was one of the first writers to give me sincere encouragement and advice. Um, I really, probably the longest conversation I ever had with him. And it was one of those conversations that seems like it went on all night. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Peelan and uh, the publishers, Fadogan and Bremer, had a party. I, I think it was World Horror Seattle. I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, just a long talk with him there about Lovecraft and, and other old-school cosmic horror writers. And it just, just a fascinating person to talk to. Um, you know, he was just delightful. I, I, the last, I was trying to remember. I think the last time I saw him was World Horror Portland, the year they gave me the Grandmaster Award. It was either there or that really terrible one in Utah afterward. I can't remember which one, but he was just as delightful then as he was the first time I met him. Um, born May 3rd, 1951. Uh, his father was uh, very active in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, his mother was Jewish. Uh, Willem grew up in Seattle. Um, you know, Early on in life, as they do, uh, he served as a Mormon missionary in Northern Ireland. Uh, where he began a correspondence with Robert Block. Once again, Dave, Robert Block, we actually. come back to Robert Block. <laughs> yeah. um, if you're a new listener and don't know what we're talking about, uh, I would point you to our, our Robert Block centennial mm-hmm. episode uh, when we had tributes uh, contributed to the show by Stephen King, David J. Scow, Wayne Sally, uh, F. Paul Wilson, many, many others. But, you know, Jack Ketchum, who we've had on this show, always talked about, you know, it was it was Robert Block who got him his start in writing. You know, Robert Block encourages a young Willem Pugmire. Robert Block gives advice to a, a young up-and-comer named Stephen King. And Robert Block, of course, was getting advice from H.P. Lovecraft. Right. Dave and I, you know, uh, we were lucky enough to see, we went to uh, the Brown University, the curator there uh, gave Dave and myself and Paul Tremblay and Mary San Giovanni and many others, a, a private showing of Lovecraft's papers. And, you know, yeah, we got to see the original manuscript for Call of Cthulhu. We got to see, you know, original manuscript for At the Mountains of Madness. We got to see letters to, you know, uh, Frank Belknap Long, letters to, you know, Robert E. Howard. We got to see a piece of paper that Lovecraft had squished a mosquito on. <laughs> And there was, like, dried blood on the piece of paper. Huh. You know, my first thought is, why the fuck don't they clone that? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but do you get... 
do you get Lovecraft or do you get a mosquito or yeah, do you get you know Cronenberg's The Fly? Yeah, I was just about to say, but um, <laughs> but the uh, coolest thing he had it was, they were gonna they were gonna do a a public showing of these, but we got to see him before that. He had all this correspondence that young Robert Block had sent Lovecraft, and you know their letters back and forth, and it was just it was so fascinating to read. But Block, of course, paid that forward, and King and Ketchum and William H. Pugmire paid it forward to our generation, and of course we're trying to pay it forward to the next generation coming up. I I think perhaps we pale in comparison. To our elders, uh, I also think, forward, and but, I'm not trying to, to disparage younger people. I also think sometimes the younger generation doesn't want to listen to the successful people as much as, as say, your generation want to listen to the people before. It. Right, that making any sense? I, I think. Yeah, I think, I think there's always going to be people like be, that. There, but. It just seems there's more of that now than there used to be. Yeah, I, I just, and I'm not, again, I'm not disparaging because there's there's plenty of people, you know. Much younger than me because I'm ancient, uh, who listen and take advice. But also, a lot of times I'll see, uh, especially online, a uh, Brian Keene or many other people just using Brian's example. Yeah, he's sitting here, but you know, Mary San Giovanni, where they'll offer advice from 20 plus years of experience, and somebody who maybe has published one book is like, "Yeah, no, fuck you, you don't know what you're talking about." And it's just like, "No, they do know what they're talking about." You know? Yeah, so, there's always going to be. People there's always going. I just think there's more of that now, and yeah. I don't think that's probably with social media where it's just. A lot yeah. of times it's just easy to go, oh, fuck you, you don't know what you're talking about. You know? Right. So On that but, note, I will take any advice <laughs> that a seasoned <laughs> writer has offered yeah. me. Yeah, well, you're smart, <laughs> you know. This is the thing. It, it, the, the thing is is, is, is you hate social media, but at the same time, it gives you access to people that you, 20 years ago, would never have had yeah, access exactly. to. exactly. Well, then, that's what I've always yeah. said. You know, I to meet to meet Skip Inspector, I had to... To park myself underage outside an over twenty one club where they were playing, to meet Joe Lansdale, I had to you know, uh, I just happened to find out he was signing at a comic book store. To 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 contact Stephen King, I had to write him a letter, right, right, and wait to get something back in the mail. These days, you go on Twitter or Facebook, yeah. you know. Um, but we've gotten way off in the weeds. I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I Will know. Will and Pugmire was you know, he was absolutely. Willing to give advice Absolutely, and support yes. people, um, you know. One thing I've always found interesting. I don't think a lot of people realize this. Um, you know, he he had this this character he played. It's sort of like a, a horror TV host called Count Pugsley uh, <laughs> that he played at the the Jones Fantastic Museum in Seattle. Um, you know, he, he and then he started doing parties and theaters and stuff as this Count Pugsley character, and that got his photo on the letters page of an old issue of Famous Monsters. Really? Yeah. There's a you know we need more readers oh, wow. like Count Pugsley. I think that's it awesome. And it's Willem Pugmire. Oh my god! That's awesome. Before he becomes Willem Pugmire, yeah, you know, that's, Count I Pugsley. Know that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mentioned you know, I I was I first discovered his work during the Zine culture, and you know back then. You would see the same names. Robert M. Price, Stanley C. Sargent. I can remember the first time I got published in a zine that also had a Stanley C. Sargent story. I got that fuck. I must have, you know, they sent you like two contributor copies. Uh, I must have bought like 12 extra. <laughs> yeah. And I, I put one in a frame, and it's still out there in my office. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, of course, our dear friend J.F. Gonzalez, uh, yeah. uh, Jeffrey Thomas, uh, D.F. Lewis, and A.R. Moreland, who were everywhere uh you know, always saw their bylines and particularly willem hopfrog pugmire um you know of the two i i would say willem and jeffrey particularly stand out you know jeffrey of course has gone on to have a a, a spectacular career uh but as far as influence you know willem's stuff it really left an impact on a generation um you know, many of his stories were set in the Susquehanna Valley. Uh, it's a fictional location in the Pacific Northwest. It's, it's you know, it's his version of Arkham or Dunwich or Innsmouth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people also forget he edited the first three issues of uh, Tales of Lovecraftian Horror magazine. Um, oh. You know, in that, in those first three issues, he published Thomas Ligotti, Jessica Amanda Salmonson, who he went on to be, you know, dear friends with, mm -hmm. uh, Ann K. Schwader, other noteworthy writers. Um, in thinking about Tales of Lovecraftian Horror, I, w I was doing some Googling. Uh, Bobby Derry 
wrote a real nice remembrance of Willem over at the Deep Cuts blog. If you just Google Deep Cuts Cuts blog and uh, Willem Pugmire, you'll you'll probably find it. Uh, but Bobby quoted some things from Tales of Lovecraftian Horror that made me realize Willem sort of predicted the future uh, with his essay Lustcraft. Lustcraft. Which is not what you think it is, man. Okay. Um, of course, with Willem Pugmire, you never know. Maybe it was. Is it about the love of love? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, he liked to fuck with people. But uh, he wrote, quote, It is a strange and curious fact that I found myself as an author and Lovecraftian only after I began to live the punk rock lifestyle. Before then, I had a sense of being different, but it wasn't until I stuck that pin in my ear and shaved off some of my hair that I truly began to feel like the outsider. This was way back in the days before Lovecraft became a game. People who knew of him had gained this occult knowledge by reading Lovecraft's fiction. And now we have a most wonderful occurrence. Punk kids are growing up to become remarkable horror authors, often blending punk with their macabre fiction. This is only natural for those of us who portray our personal lives and loves in horror fiction. He went on to say, other punk kids are joining the throng. They have oddly colored hair and pierced faces. They listen to death metal and goth rock. They're avid fans of H.P. Lovecraft. Our ranks are growing. Our voices will be heard. Our horror fiction will wear within its soul our punk rock angst. Our fiction, like our music, will be the voice of the outsider. End quote. I mean, he called it right there. Yeah. You know, that was, uh, that would have been probably... 1990? Oh, wow. 1991? Oh, Jeez. And so, even mentioning, like, death metal being, yeah. like, an emergence yeah. with punk rock. That, I mean, yeah, you, that's you, crazy. You look, yeah, at, that's... You, look at the, <laughs> you look at the splatter punk generation. You know, Skip, Inspector, and Scowl, and those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, and then you look at our generation that comes along. You know, Tremblay, and Laird Barron, and Livia Llewellyn, and, and Mary, and myself, and Gonzalez. He, he called it right there. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. Even up to the point we mentioned earlier in the show about, you know, my son's fifth grade class, every one of those kids knows who Cthulhu is. Yeah. You know, it, it, so, yeah, he, he was not only an excellent author and poet and essayist, he was a, he was a fortune teller. He was a seer. Yeah. He could see the future. Very wise. Um, you know, if you've not read him... Um, you know, some of his books include Tales of the Susquehanna Valley, Dreams of Lovecraftian Horror, Tales of Love and Death, uh, The Fungal Stain, Some Unknown Gulf of Night, Gathered Dust, uh, you know, Monstrous Aftermath, um, Witches in Dreamland, which he co-wrote with David H. Barker, uh, Encounters with Enoch Coffin, which he co-wrote with Jeffrey Thomas. Um, you know, most of his stuff was, was collections. Uh, you know, he only wrote to the best of my knowledge, one novel length work. Um, but yeah, it, it, if you're a fan of, of Lovecraftian horror or just really well done atmospheric supernatural horror, I encourage you to seek his stuff out. Um, but don't take my word for it. Let's go to the genre. Uh, let's start with Willem's friend Jeffrey Thomas, uh, you know, also a friend of ours. By the way, I want to apologize to the listening audience, and to, although Willem would have gotten a kick yeah, out of Willem this, I think. Yeah, you, you, you <laughs> um, endlessly amusing. Yeah, normally we record in the studio. I have a studio here on my fortified compound along the banks of the Susquehanna <laughs> River, and we record in there. Uh, today, we're recording in the house in the living room, which means that the you might hear what sounds like China and Russia and America converging <laughs> on each other in Venezuela. No. That's the cats fighting in the background. They're not fighting. They're playing. They're playing. But, yeah. but, yeah, so I, I, I apologize. But, yeah, <laughs> Jeffrey Thomas, uh, he posted the following on Facebook. He says, quote, I'm seeing a lot of tributes to my friend of 27 years, W.H. Pugmire, upon his having passed early this morning. He was my closest of writer friends. I can't articulate much right now. I think I'll be posting about Willem in fragments, relating individual memories, citing particular pieces of his work, but right now it's just too big and hard to process. I can mostly just say that my soul's been clubbed to its knees, end quote. Jeffrey, I empathize and I understand all too well, brother. Um, you know, losing J.F. Gonzalez and Tom Piccirilli, and more recently Gak, uh, I... And, you know, 
Jack Ketchum, Dallas Mayor, who was a mentor to me. I, I, I understand exactly how you feel. I think you summed it up perfectly right there. Uh, I wish I could say it gets easier. It does not. The one thing I have found... And I shared this with S.T. Yoshi earlier in the week. The one thing I found that helps me is, uh, you know, working on Jesus' estate. I was put in charge of his literary estate, his, his executor. And, you know, finding homes for unpublished stuff does bring me right. comfort and peace. But uh, I hope you find some as well, Jeffrey. Um, so let's go to uh, author, editor, publisher, and scholar John Peelan, um, who I'm always happy to hear from who I wish was doing more these days. Uh, He wrote this for us. He says, quote, A week ago, the world became a little colder, a bit more cruel and unyielding, and in short, just a bit less fun of a place to be when Willem Hopfrog Pugmire took the next step on the cosmic odyssey that joins us all together. I haven't lived in Seattle for over a decade, so I don't know how well I would recognize the city where I grew up and had the privilege of knowing Willem Pugmire. We saw each other frequently, both being riders of public transport as opposed to drivers and drifting about the same used bookstores and similar haunts. We were both outsiders from the very start. The flamboyantly gay zine publisher who remains the only person I ever knew that loved punk and disco at the same time and with the same passion, and the Irish street trash punk who had read 90% of the weird fiction ever published in the English language. Of course, that odd appearing would become friends. I'm sorry, I have to stop for a moment. Because this is this yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. And John, I love you, man. Um, he goes on to say, I could talk for hours about what a kind, gentle soul Willem was, but anyone that knew him will share similar thoughts. I want to take just a few moments to talk about something we only rarely get to see, and that is how good, that is how a good writer becomes a great one. Back in the early 2000s, after the anthology that no one wanted, Dark Side, became a hit, I was reading for what was to become the second volume in the Dark Side series when I received a submission from Willem and Chad Hensley. I liked the story, but there was something missing, and not being aware that editors don't really do things like this anymore, I called up both writers and invited them to my house to discuss (laughs) the story and maybe make some changes. Chad was and remains primarily a poet and writer of nonfiction essays. Willem, despite over two decades of publication, was still seeing the vast majority of his work appearing in Lovecraftian fanzines rather than professional publications. So they humored me and agreed to come over. We took that story apart word by word, line by line. It was an amazing experience for me. You see, what was missing was a story. Willem and Chad had the atmosphere of the strange intruding into the mundane world down pat. What wasn't there at the beginning was any reason to care. We fixed that, that and that's what made the afternoon so memorable for me. I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to work so intimately with another writer as I did that day, and I don't know that those of you reading this will ever get the chance to work that closely with a true artist. But I did get that chance with Willem, and it was unforgettable. Here was a man who had been writing his version of H.P. Lovecraft for over two decades, but watching him as we dissected the story was a treat. You could see just how hungry he was to push himself beyond anyone's ideas of his limitations to be an even better writer. In closing, John says, I'm not now... Nor was I then arrogant enough to think that I could teach Willem Pugmire anything about conveying an atmosphere of the weird. I couldn't do that any more than I could teach Clark Ashton Smith anything about poetic structure. All I could do was make suggestions about pacing and tossing in some quick cheats to further establish character development, and what was amazingly cool was to see the light in Willem's eyes as he logged every one of those comments somewhere in that mental notebook that we writers all have for further review and use. I don't know today if anything I said on that long ago afternoon was ultimately useful to him or not. I do know that over the next few years, I was able to see my friend go from being a good writer to becoming a great one, and that I was able to work closely with someone who became one of our best remains one of my fondest memories of my work in this field. Godspeed, Willem. You will always be remembered. John Peelan. John, I would like to put a pin in that. You said you don't know of anything that you told him that afternoon was ultimately useful, stay tuned to the end of the show. There's something I want you to listen to. Um, 
couple short tributes. Novelist, podcaster, original gangster, Marvel Comics architect, and friend of the show, Scott Edelman. Uh, he says, quote, Willem was a sweet human being, a wonderful writer, and always a joy to chat with. He's gone much too soon. Olivia Llewellyn. Uh, Willem was a breathtakingly original Lovecraftian writer. One of the best. There aren't enough gentle, talented eccentrics in the world, and we are poor for his departing it. I suspect wherever he is, there is a lot of lipstick and glitter. Rest in peace, beautiful <laughs> Eldritch Queen, Olivia Llewellyn. You notice here, you know, everybody, gentle, kind, yeah. you know, joyous. That was him. Um, sorry, I had to take a pause to, because John's was wonderfully long, and the next one's wonderfully long, and I wanted to take a pause there and wet my whistle. Um, <laughs> our next one is from St. Yoshi. Now, I know we have a lot of older listeners. I know we have a lot of younger listeners. I know our younger listeners like to get themselves whipped up into a frenzy. So let me let me preface this, okay? Yes. S.T. Yoshi has said some unkind things about me and about my friends on the internet. I, in turn, have said some unkind things in jest on this show and on my blog. Um, this isn't about that. I reached, S.T. Yoshi was the first person I reached out to when we put this show together. And I reached out to him in sincerity. Um, you know, this is a man that's grieving the loss of his friend. As I said earlier, you know, with Jeffrey Thomas's quote, I get that, you know, and, and if, if I can help alleviate some of that pain in any way by giving him a chance to talk about his friend, yeah. I'm goddamn going to do it. Um, and if any of you disrespect that or make fun of that, then, then fuck you, quite frankly. Um, you know, uh, so I want to thank Mr. Yoshi. Um, you know, we emailed back and forth all, all week, and uh, I feel for him. I feel for what he's going through, and I want to thank him for penning this this just this beautiful remembrance, uh, which I'm going to read now on the air. Uh, I believe he's going to put it up on his website. In fact, by the time this show airs, it might be up on his website. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go back and, and read it without, you know, my hillbilly voice probably <laughs> mangling it here. <clears throat> I need another drink. There you go. Um, <laughs> it's 11 in the morning. Is it too early for whiskey? No. no. Go get me whiskey, Matt. It's in there in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, no. I, I got I to gotta pick the kid up from school today. Hey, All right. One won't hurt. This is... Uh, <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is my friend Willem Pugmire by S.T. Yoshi. The winter of 2018-2019 was unusually severe here in Seattle. In particular, in early February, we suffered an unprecedented series of heavy snowstorms that paralyzed the city. We rarely get snow, and the city is ill-equipped to deal with it. Most of us were merely unconvenienced or housebound, but Willem's fate proved to be more severe. He went into the emergency room in mid-February, complaining of chest pains and difficulty breathing. He was diagnosed with pneumonia. That didn't sound too bad, but we were concerned and frustrated that he didn't seem to be improving as quickly as he should have been. My wife Mary and I visited him several times and were alarmed to see him gasping and unable to sit up for any length of time. And yet, he nonetheless did seem to get better and we learned that the pneumonia had finally left him. But he continued to linger in the hospital for weeks, then for more than a month. It appeared that the pneumonia had exacerbated the heart condition he'd been suffering from for years and for which, I'm sorry to report, he didn't take his medications quite as dil diligently as he should have. <clears throat> Excuse me. At some point during that dreary month at Harborview Medical Center, he came to understand that the end had come upon him. He faced this realization with what I thought was incredible grace and quiet resolve. He said that a few weeks short of his 68th birthday, he had lived a full, rich life, and had accomplished many of the literary goals he had set out for himself. And who can deny that? By late March, he decided that he would prefer to spend his last days at home, surrounded by his family, friends, and especially his beloved pets, which numbered six cats and two dogs. I spent much of the afternoon of Monday, March 25th with him, and he was indeed surrounded by some of the people, and there are many, 
who meant so much to him. I was present when, in accordance with his own wishes, his sister Holly turned off the heart pump that was largely keeping him alive. We had been told that this act might result in his death within minutes, but in fact he lingered for about 10 hours, passing away in the wee hours of the morning of March 26th. And yet, I do not wish to speak of his death, but of his life. I am no doubt one of many who regard him as one of the kindest, gentlest, most tolerant and generous human beings to have ever walked the earth. I know that the feuding that is so seemingly endemic to our social media culture saddened and dismayed him, and I take responsibility for contributing more than my share of abuse, insult, and billingsgate. Many individuals knew him far longer than I did, but I like to believe we gained a special rapport because of our mutual devotion to H.P. Lovecraft. Willem was reluctant to speak of himself, but he often regaled us with how he discovered the dreamer from Providence while conducting missionary work for the Mormon church, to which he remained devoted in spite of the church's own cruel prejudice, now only slightly moderated against gays and other groups. While dodging bullets and bombs in Northern Ireland in his early 1970s, he stumbled upon a paperback of Lovecraft's tales and was immediately captivated. He wrote for years, even decades, in obscurity, but his creative work was an act of love, not commerce, just as, as it had been for Lovecraft. He was as surprised as any when, after so many years, he gained a following and saw his work published far and wide. He was tickled when only a few months ago a German edition of his tales appeared. He and I became close when I moved to Seattle in the fall of 2001. He would often stop by my house in the university district on his way to or from the Mormon temple. Later, Mary and I would often have him over for dinner, and we were pleased at how much relish he took in the dishes she offered. And why not? She's an excellent cook. In particular, we enjoyed sharing with him the large Virginia ham that Derek Hussey would habitually send me as a Christmas present. He was also a central figure in our local gang of Lovecraftians. I picture a, a gang composed of... <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I hate yeah. to interrupt, but you got John Peelan and S.T. Yoshi and Chad Hensley and... and, and and Willem Pugmire, you know, yeah, with, with, with one of his crowns, and uh, yeah. This is the best remake of the Warriors ever. Yeah, yeah, the that's, that's the Warriors remake yeah. right there. Yeah. Perfect. You know, um, although his native shyness made him a largely silent participant in our gatherings, he would occasionally add a charming anecdote or make some other remark that displayed both his shrewdness and his humanity. One of the greatest thrills of his life was visiting Providence in 2007, where he could at last walk in the footsteps of his literary master. That trip inspired dozens of tales, including some of his best. He attended the H.P. Lovecraft Festival in Portland as often as his health would allow, although later admitting that such trips, including one that he took just last year, overtaxed him and probably worsened his heart condition. But at least some of his many friends and devotees had a chance to meet him in person, as he sat on a bench outside the Hollywood Theater and spoke a kind word to all. We disagreed on several subjects, but that did not lessen our bond. As an atheist, I was bemused by his Mormon faith, and part of the tranquility he exhibited at the end was inspired by his firm belief that, after his transition out of this life, he would meet all the people who had meant so much to him, not just friends or family members, but the great literary figures, Shakespeare, Henry James, Poe, Oscar Wilde, and Lovecraft himself. If that belief gave him comfort in his final hours, who has the right to deny it to him? This is not the place for an evaluation of William's literary work. Impressive as that was, it is the human being I care to remember. When Lovecraft himself died, tragically early, there was an outpouring of grief, just as there has now been for Willem and a longtime friend, Charles W. Smith, summed up his sense of closeness to Lovecraft by the simple words, He was my friend. I am one of many who can consider themselves lucky to have been Willem's friend. The world is a little poorer without him. That was beautifully written. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And again, sir, thank you so much for writing that for us. Uh, we appreciate it. I know the listening audience will appreciate it. I'm sure Willem will appreciate it. Uh... A couple more short uh, remembrances. Uh, Jesse, host of the Dead Man's Tome podcast, where I'm going to be appearing. If we, the problem is they book their guests like four months out at a time. Oh my God, and I just I never know my schedule. Right, yeah, right. Um, yeah, but I, I want to do that podcast. Um, 
he says, quote, a huge loss. I didn't know him personally, but the loss felt by those that did is very telling. Um, Lehman Kessler, of course, of the very popular Ask Lovecraft, uh, recorded the following. Dave, do you have that queued up there? Let's listen to that. Hi, everyone. This is Lehman. Um, I've just learned of the passing of Willem Pugmire, who was uh, an author and a poet and a legend. Uh, he has uh, been a, a long time um, just fixture of the weird fiction community, and he was impossibly kind to me. Uh, when when my show was just getting started, when when no one knew who I was um, before any you know invitations to conventions, um, you know being asked to be part of books or or films or anything, uh, Willem took the time to talk about my show. Uh, he had his own web series uh, that he would occasionally dress up and dance for and 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 talk about uh, his work and and what was happening in his life and he and he talked about my show and it was sort of the first time anyone in the community had welcomed me in and he didn't need to do that but he chose to and he was so gracious every time i got the chance to meet him and and talk with him it was it was a wonderful, wonderful, strange, and just absolutely fascinating time. Um, if you've never read any of his stories, I highly recommend you do. Um, he he wrote in, in sort of in, in Lovecraftian veins, and he he wrote his own uh, had his own worlds uh, that he explored, and he he loved the best things about Lovecraft and celebrated the best things about Lovecraft, and he will be missed, but. More than that, he will be cherished. He'll be loved. And I, I, if this is the very first time you've ever heard about him, then I recommend you go find his work. You find his poetry. You find his videos of him dancing maniacally and beautifully and terrifyingly. It's, um, it's a thing to behold. Um, we will miss you, Willem. And we will remember you. And we will cherish you. God bless. Okay, uh, you know, earlier we were talking about folks from the zine culture. Uh, many will remember Pam Chilamy Yeager. Uh, she was very prominent in the zines back in the day. Um, she writes the following, quote, The late great days of Scavenger's Newsletter, a chapbook of strange stories, Jeffrey Thomas's Necropolitan Press, the elegantly weird residents of Sesco Valley with the moaning wind and soft, wet, sucking sounds of death. Fast forward to social media and YouTube. The hats, the makeup, the persona, the stories. Willem and another author, who shall remain nameless, at some convention in a wee face-off over said hats, his devout rediscovered Mormon faith. To me, he was the John Lennon of Lovecraftian mythos fiction who treated me, the roadie, with some trunk stories as a compatriot. It's probably better that I didn't initially know what a big deal he was, or I would have been too intimidated to approach him on social media. Over time, we messaged about Brad Paisley, yep, Revlon makeup, and the stray cats he took in. He gave me invaluable feedback on some stories to sit next to him and sign books at a con. Are you kidding? Still, the thrill of meeting this sweet, kind, witty, funny man as a friend actually outweighed the thrill of his dazzling status. That's how amazing his heart was. A few years ago, I planned to attend another con, and we discussed at length the Willem mask that I could wear to read some of his work. It was to be his picture adhered to some sort of pointy hat with appropriate Ravens, Poe, and Lovecraft images emblazoned upon it. Life happens, and the con didn't materialize, but I will always cherish the time beforehand and the fun it was to discuss the mask. Somewhere, it's in a box of mementos. I know he had much closer, long-standing friends than me and can't imagine the depth of their loss, but his grace, kindness, and humility touched so many, and his work will outlive him and stand the test of time. If there's a heaven, he's in it. End quote. Um, Stephen L. Shrewsbury. Probably not the first person you'd think of no. to contribute a... a, a and, and I mean no, no, no disrespect to that. It's just... Stephen's writing was night and day. It's so you know, far apart. Um, yeah. You know, Stephen has right. no bones about it. He's a, he's a conservative yeah. guy. Yeah. Uh, his really touched me here because I know what it meant to Stephen to hear this. Uh, 
He says that all he talked, although he talked to Willem in passing at many conventions, there's one thing that he holds dear. Quote, At World Horror Salt Lake City in 2008, I participated in a mass poetry slam thing. One of the things I did was read Robert E. Howard's Red Thunder. After it was all done, he approached me briefly, shaking my hand and saying, Stirring! but it sounded as if you were channeling Johnny Cash as well as Howard. End quote. <laughs> if you know anything about Stephen L. Shrewsbury, yeah, exactly. his two icons are Robert E. Howard and yeah. Johnny Cash. Yeah. And cool. Willem, not knowing that, picked up, picked on, up it. on it immediately. Wow. Jeez, that's um, really cool. you know, once again, a seer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Author John Langan contributes this piece called On Willem. There are other people who knew Willem Pugmire much better than I did. In our encounters... She was unfailingly kind, gentle, and generous. The world I continue to associate with Willem is style, both in terms of personal presentation and artistic expression. Meeting her for the first time was an unforgettable experience. Although she called herself the Queen of Eldritch Har, she reminded me of more of a high priestess, her head decorated with a kind of homemade crown, a photograph of one of her cultural idols affixed to the front. I can't recall which one. It could have been Poe, Wild Shakespeare, or Boy George. Google images of Willem, and you'll see some of the ways in which she made herself a canvas for different expressions of her identity. I keep returning to her crowns. Each photograph strikes me as a kind of literalized figure of speech, the image of the particular writer or singer she has on her mind. Together, those images form a personal pantheon, one whose saints share a love for language dense and lyrical. Those same words might be applied to Willem's own prose, which shows the same infatuation with the possibilities of English present in her favorite writers. I don't think you can go very far in discussing her work without mentioning the importance of H.P. Lovecraft to it. Indeed, on more than one occasion, she described herself as obsessed with his work and life. Rather than being made anxious by her passion, however, she indulged it, ecstatically even. This led to an achievement that is, as far as I'm aware, unique in weird horror fiction. Willem employed a style that anyone who's read Lovecraft recognizes as heavily indebted to him. Willem was far from the first to do so, but the difference is Willem's work was neither parody nor pastiche. It neither mocked Lovecraft, nor did it seek simply to deliver more of the same, a kind of cover band in prose. Instead, by submerging herself in Lovecraft's approach to writing, Willem demonstrated and explored the further possibilities inherent in it. The result is a body of work that is simultaneously deeply of Lovecraft and deeply of Willem. From what I knew of Willem, such an assessment would have pleased her to no end. John Langan. Okay. Um, we have audio from Bob Freeman as well? Absolutely. All right. Let, uh, author Bob Freeman, let's cue that up. Willem Pugmire was a tremendous talent. Such a kind and gentle soul. His words were like poetry, and I, I just I respected his work so much. I had the opportunity to review Gathered Dust and Others, his collection from 2012, and he enjoyed that review very much. And he reached out to me, which I was you know, taken aback by, and we struck up a, a correspondence and a friendship. Um, and I just, I knew him for far too short a time, and he will be missed. Okay, and finally, uh, Miguel Flieger the author of Cooking with Lovecraft, Supernatural Horror in the Kitchen, he sends along the following. Um, I notice the cats have continued throughout yes. Willem's tribute yes, here. Again, I, I, think that, I think that's appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the, the mic is picking it up or not, but uh, Miguel Flieger says, quote, Reading this week's tributes to Willem all across the weirdo sphere, besides his mastery of the craft, everybody mentions his kindness and how he was always ready to lend a hand to Lovecraftian neophytes he had just met by chance. And that was exactly my experience. In 2016, I had just self-published my first book and sent a copy to S.T. Yoshi, another super kind guy. Unbeknownst to me, around that time, Willem was visiting S.T. at his home, where he saw the paperback, took a selfie with it in one of his inimitable punk outfits and makeup, and proceeded to A make that selfie his Facebook header picture for a few days, wow. and B, post some exceedingly kind words about his favorite stories from the book. Now, Matt, 
Yes. You self-published your first Cosmic Horror collection this year. I gave it to you, and you took no pictures. I took no <laughs> selfies. Did not use it as my Facebook cover photo. Didn't even use it as toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel goes on to say, uh, you know, he, that Willem said some exceedingly kind words about his favorite stories from the book. I was absolutely floored by his generosity and the visible boost he gave to a complete stranger from yeah. across the globe. The news of his passing affected me deeply, even when I never met him and only briefly corresponded on Facebook. I felt like I had lost a friend, and I can't even fathom the sorrow of his friends of so many years of feeling now. The world is a little less weird, and that's a shame. Uh, P.S. For people that aren't familiar with his work, get the Strange Dark One collection and fly on the undulating winds over the Sesqua Valley. Thanks for the chance to pay the respects to the master. Best regards from Buenos Aires. Miguel Flieger. Um, Miguel sent along the selfie. Now, you know, our show airs every week, of course, on iTunes and Spotify and wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, but we also always post it on YouTube, yes. along with, you know, still images. I'm going to include Miguel's selfie. So those of you who, who do listen to the show on, on YouTube, you've probably seen it by now. It's probably flashed across your screen. Um, all right, finally, uh, as I said at the start of the show, we never got a chance to interview Willem on this show. Um, but, he, you know, he's done a lot of interviews over the year. Uh, a lot of them are in print. Um, but then, you know, there, there's some good stuff on YouTube. Uh, my favorite is one that Mike Davis at Lovecraft e did last year. He conducted it back in April of 2018 uh, with his co-hosts. Mike has generously given us permission to play an excerpt. Now, it's a short excerpt. I think Davis, what, like 10 minutes long? It's not like a, yeah. Um, it goes back to what John Peelan was talking about, though, yeah, about characterization, mm-hmm. um, which is what I want John to hear. John, if you're still listening. Um, but, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, I really encourage you, especially after you've listened to this excerpt, go listen to the entire interview. It's like two hours long. It's a really long interview. It's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yes. Um Plus, uh, the one co-host is wearing pink earphones. Yes, and they they give him shit about it through the whole show. It's it's like what we do to you, man. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you go to YouTube and in the search bar, just put in Lovecraftian writer W. H. Pugmire. This is the very first thing that pops up. Mike Davis, Lovecraft Ezine. Uh, so let's listen to that now, Dave. Uh, Pete. Okay, so let's talk about your style of writing because it's it's. It's very different from what you sort of expect from a Lovecraftian writer, at least what the ones that have emerged since Lovecraft. You're very concerned with atmosphere and mood. Yes. And rather than um See, I don't this is it. I don't read other Lovecraftian fiction. I read very little horror fiction. So I don't know what the trend the modern trend is. And um I don't I don't think it would affect me in any way if I did, except maybe it would just bore me. And I'm thinking, gee, I'm glad I don't write like that. <laughs> I it's I I like to be old fashioned. I like to be different. I, I, it's part of the punk rock ethic, perhaps, but it's also a very natural voice for me. Is the and it it might come because I I, I read so much of. Of, you know the fiction from the yellow 90s the decadent findy cycle oscar wilde type fiction and and that's just what appeals to me um and i i don't i i don't think i could i could write in any other way and and there's no reason why i i i, I would have to it's um I, I like writing for a very distinct audience, and it might be a small audience, but they they have been absolutely devoted, and I adore them. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> no, it, it's definitely a, a a unique and independent voice mm-hmm. uh, in the Lovecraftian field. Yes, um, there, have people, there have been people. There have there there have been people online that do discussions of just the trash the way I write. 
because they they hate it so much <laughs> and uh, in in a way that's kind of a compliment as well so what the heck well i mean the purpose of fiction is to to engender response mm -hmm. if you've struck someone emotionally whether that's good or bad you've engendered that response right. art art creates a response right the only thing that annoys me is when people consider my style an affectation. There is no affectation in my work. It is absolutely genuine. Well, I think if, it, if those people who have been lucky enough to spend time with you, mm -hmm. even see you on panels or at film festivals or whatnot, will realize that this is the way you speak, this is the way you act, this is the way you are, mm -hmm. and it comes through in your writing. You're very concerned with mood and atmosphere and the subtleness of the weird. Yes. Many people go way overboard on bringing in this monstrous thing. But I can remember, I think, when Rebecca Pascal shows up, it's almost as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It was in something that was inevitably going to happen. So the main character is like, oh, yeah, you're here. I, I, yeah, I know you're dead, but... You're back. Um, I, I like I like working with personalities and characterization, and unless you're very clever, you 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 can't convey that with a monster. You know, I, unless you're very very clever. So, so m most of my concentration will be on human characters, but they're 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 always slightly bent and sinister and hopefully unique. Well, I, I think that's one of the things that you've accomplished really well is that where Lovecraft would focus on the academic, you have focused on the, the artist, mm -hmm. um, particularly with any Sesma Valley stories and Mount Seldna. Mm -hmm. um, these are interesting places full of interesting people and anybody who walks in you know is not going to have a good time right but it's going to be an interesting time mm -hmm. um, Sesqua, Sesqua Valley is mainly a community of artists and and usually the people that enter in that are not artistic are the ones who are utterly doomed so but there have been artists who, uh, I mean, everybody is pretty much doomed in Sesqua Valley, except for Simon Gregory Williams. So, <laughs> in, in many ways, I've seen people compare it to Dunwich, but in many ways for me, it reminds me more of Carl Jacoby's version of, of Kingsport from Chameleon Town. Oh, yes. Um, this, this place that's mystical and magical and there's an undertone of the malevolent but as long as you know what you're doing you'll be okay well you know i i i based sesla valley on north bend which is here you know here in washington state and it's i i spent two weeks of every summer visiting my cousins in north bend and riding down the river on an inner tube and you know, walking through the forest tra trails and things like that. And so when I decided to write Lovecraftian horror, I, I knew that I wanted to in invent my own special locality, as Lovecraft did with Arkham and Dunwich and Infamous, and Ramsey Campbell did. And it just felt like a very Lovecraftian thing to do, to invent your own Lovecraftian set place, and so I, I just thought I'll use North Bend, and it'll, and I, I, I invented the word Sesqua because I thought it sounded Native American. We have towns in Washington like Issaquah, Snoqualmie, so I wanted that qua sound. So I, so I said, okay, Sesqua, and. Uh, I thought I totally made it up, and then I, I found out there was an actual place called Sesqua. I think it's in Ohio or somewhere. <laughs> then, yeah, 
it, it has served me well. All right, so there you have it. Uh, that is our tribute to Willem H. Pugmire. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's more that can be said. I, I want to thank everybody that uh, that sent in tributes, that gave us permission to read them on the air. Uh, I want to especially thank Mike Davis at Lovecraft Easing for giving us permission to read that excerpt. While I'm thinking of it, I want to remind folks, uh, you know, last year, our industry got hit with a wave of GoFundMes for creatives like Jack Herringa of the Shirley Jackson Awards and Dustin LaValle and myself. Um, you know, we needed help with medical bills. You know, I, I, I burnt my elbow down to the bone. Yeah. You know, Jack was having all his heart problems. You know, Dustin was just going through a, a nightmare. Um, and everybody stepped up and they contributed money to the GoFundMe. Um, you know, speaking of Mike Davis who's, you know, we just heard that interview. Um, his son is going through some medical stuff right now, and they need help with the medical bills. Uh, they have a GoFundMe set up. I tweeted about it. I'm also going to include the link on uh, the Horror Show with Brian Keene's Facebook page, but uh, I'm trying to see if it if I Google. See, I'm looking at it on my phone, so it doesn't give me the actual link. The link yes, yes. Um, if you go to If you go to GoFundMe, and Google Mike Davis, uh, I believe, Google Mike Davis Logan Medical Bills, GoFundMe, and it should pop up. As I said, I'm going to I'm gonna put the link up on uh, our Facebook page, though, and I'll, I'll tweet it out again as well. But if you could contribute a dollar and help his son out, uh, you know, us here at the show, we'd really, really, really appreciate that. Um, Speaking of contributing dollars, one more time, <laughs> thanks to this week's sponsors. Uh, first of all, Aaron Vlex, the private collector. Uh, that is a, a new audio series uh, that's coming out from Parsec Award winner, The Wicked Library. Um, it's a whirlwind trek through magic, hex, juju, and every sort of hoo-ha you can imagine. From New Orleans to Cairo to the American Old West. Uh, you'll encounter the Arabian Jinn, Old World Hex Babies, Enchanted Foxes, the mysterious Baron Samidi, Old Coyote himself. Um, that's The Private Collector by Aaron Vleck, uh, available right now at thewickedlibrary.com and on iTunes and YouTube. This week's show is also brought to you by Creature Feature Weekend, an all-new horror convention uh, that's taking place in historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Labor Day weekend. For complete details, go to CreatureFeatureWeekend.com. Next week, Jeff Burke. Are you ready for this, Dave? I'm absolutely ready for this, yes. No holds barred. Uh, Well, I mean, Jeff is never no holds barred. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, this will be his his first interview, as far as I know, unless he gives one to somebody else between now and next week. Better not. Uh, You better not, (laughs) you little fucker. Yeah, Um, (laughs) exactly, fucker. You know, uh, this will be his his first interview since leaving Deadite. So we'll hear what he has to say. Um, In the meantime, if you enjoy this show, you might also enjoy a few other things. First of all, I have another podcast. It's called Defenders Dialogue. I host that every week with Christopher Golden. And what we do is we talk about Bronze Age Marvel comic books. Uh, you might enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans. That's a show that Mary hosts every week. Uh, a very academic literary show where she talks about cosmic horror beyond H.P. Lovecraft. Um, William Hope Hodgson. Uh Algernon Blackwood's The Willows, all the way up to modern day stuff like the Silent Hill video game franchise or the film The Void. Um, both of those are available wherever you listen to The Horror Show with Brian Keen. You might also enjoy Matt's show, Grindcast. Every week, he and his compadres talk about video, game, video games. And if you just haven't had enough, if you need even more excitement and cats in your life, uh, go to Twitch dot tv slash meteor notes meteor notes and you can watch dave you can watch dave play video games you can watch him babble at his cats it's just like (laughs) having him here in person um of course to advertise on the horror show go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com click contact 
and tell Armand, Rose, and Amelia you would like to spend money. But if you don't want to advertise, you can still spend money while you're there. You can buy a hard show with Brian Keen, coffee mug, t-shirt, bumper sticker, and more. Uh, until next week, folks. Bye. bye. See ya. Ladies and gentlemen, Project Entertainment Network presents The Mondo Method. An old man with a goatee teaches a younger guy with a beard how to write. Introducing first, he's the mentor and the greatest manager of all time, Mondo Guerrero. And from parts unknown, up and coming superstar, The Great Buddha. Okay, so maybe the names are really just Armand Rosamilia and Chuck Buddha, and maybe you'll learn something while they're at it. Wednesdays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.